Nove Miesto, 1939. On March 15, 1939, Hitler's Nazi troops marched into the rest of Czechoslovakia, and the Brady family's life was changed forever. The Nazis declared that Jews were evil, a bad influence, dangerous. From now on, the Brady family and the other Jews in Nove Miesto would have to live by different rules. Jews could only leave their houses at certain hours of the day. They could only shop in certain stores and only at certain times. Jews weren't allowed to travel, so there were no more visits to beloved aunts, uncles, and grandmothers in nearby towns. The Bradys were forced to tell the Nazis about everything they owned, art, jewelry, cutlery, bank books. They hurriedly stashed their most precious papers under the shingles in the attic. Father's stamp collection and mother's silver were hidden with Gentile, non-Jewish, friends. But the family radio had to be taken to a central office and surrendered to a Nazi official. One day, Hannah and George lined up at the movie theater to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. When they got to the box office, they saw a sign that read, No Jews Allowed. Their faces red, their eyes burning, Hannah and George turned on their heels and headed for home. When Hannah walked in the door, she was furious and very upset. What is happening to us? Why can't I go to the movies? Why can't I just ignore the sign? Mother and father looked grimly at each other. There were no easy answers. Every week seemed to bring a new restriction. No Jews in the playground. No Jews on the sports fields. No Jews in the parks. Soon, Hannah could no longer go to the gym. Even the skating pond was declared off limits. Her friends, all of them Gentiles, at first were as mystified by the rules as Hannah. They sat together in school, as they always had, and still had good times making mischief in the classroom and in private backyards. We'll be together forever, no matter what promised Hannah's best friend, Maria. We're not going to let anyone tell us who we can play with. But gradually, as the months dragged on, all Hannah's playmates, even Maria, stopped coming over after school and on the weekends. Maria's parents had ordered her to stay away from Hannah. They were afraid the Nazis would punish their whole family for allowing Maria to be friends with a Jewish child. Hannah was terribly lonely. With each loss of friendship, and with each new restriction, Hannah and George felt their world grow a little smaller. They were angry, they were sad, and they were frustrated. What can we do? They asked their parents. Where can we go now? Mother and father tried their best to distract the children, to help them find new ways to have fun. We are lucky, mother told them because we have such a big garden. You can play hide and seek, you can swing from the trees, you can invent games, you can play detective in the storerooms, you can explore the secret tunnel, you can play charades. Be grateful that you have each other. Hannah and George were grateful to have each other, and they did play together, but it didn't make them feel any better about all the things they couldn't do anymore all the places they couldn't go. On a fine spring day, when the sun was shining, the two of them sat in the meadow, bored, fiddling with the grass. Suddenly, Hannah burst into tears. It's not fair, she cried. I hate this. I want it to be like it was before. She yanked a fistful of grass out of the ground and threw it in the air. She looked at her brother. She knew he was as miserable as she was. Right here, he said, I have an idea. In minutes, he was back, carrying a pad of paper, a pen, an empty bottle, and a shovel. What's all that for? Maybe if we write down all the things that are bothering us, he said, it'll help us feel better. That's stupid, Hannah replied. It won't bring back the park or the playground. 
it won't bring back Maria. But George insisted. He was, after all, the big brother, and Hannah didn't have a better idea. And so, for the next several hours, the children poured their unhappiness onto paper, with George doing most of the writing and Hannah doing much of the talking. They made lists of things they missed, lists of things they were angry about. Then, they made lists of all the things they would do, all the things they would have, and all the places they would go when these dark times were over. When they were done, George took the sheets of paper, rolled them into a tube, stuffed them into the bottle, and popped in the cork. Then the two of them walked back toward the house, stopping at the double swing. There, Hannah dug a big hole. This would be a hiding place for some of their sadness and frustration. George placed the bottle at the bottom of the hole, and Hannah filled the space back up with earth. And when it was all over, the world seemed a little lighter and brighter, at least for the day. It was hard to make sense of everything that was happening, especially now that the family radio was gone. Father and mother had depended on hearing the eight o'clock news every night from London, England, to keep them informed of Hitler's latest evil act. But Jews had been ordered inside their houses by eight. Listening to the radio was absolutely forbidden, and the penalty for breaking any law was very severe. Everyone was afraid of being arrested. Father hatched a plan, an ingenious way to get around the Nazi rules. He asked his old friend, the keeper of the big church clock, to do him a favor. Would he mind, Father asked, turning the clock back 15 minutes in the early evenings? That way, Father could rush to the neighbor's house, hear the news, and be safely home when the bell rang at 8, which was actually 8.15. The Nazi guard who patrolled the town square didn't have a clue. And father was thrilled that his scheme had worked. Unfortunately, the news he was able to hear on the radio was bad, very bad. The Nazis were winning every battle, advancing on every front.